Hey guys, today is uh, March 2nd, 2020. It's 10.30 in the morning here in China. Um, I want to go over some of the things that have uh, happened recently here, but before I do, I just want to make a few comments. You probably uh, are hearing some chopping noises, some weird thumping noises, and it's because our neighbors upstairs are cooking, so I apologize for that if that's showing up in the audio. Um, and I know in every one of these videos, I, I kind of shoot from a different angle, and it's because of the daylight and the lighting, and I know it doesn't look great sometimes, and I apologize for that. I kind of am doing these as, as fast as I can as far as the production goes. I'm not really trying to set up a really nice nice shot every time, so please bear with me and try to focus on the information and not the uh, screen. Um, so let's just go over what's going on here, first of all. Um, so we're under quarantine. We just came back from Korea, which is considered a high-risk area by Chinese authorities now. So. We are currently on a 40-day uh, restriction, or 14-day, rather, restriction. We can't go outside. We can't leave our front door. Anything that we need needs to be delivered to our house. Um, we've prepared for this, so in advance, we bought two weeks' worth of grocery. We have water lined up on the floor in our kitchen, vegetables, meat in the freezer, everything. So we're, we're set for the next two weeks. We can't leave the house. Um, and this is all imposed by, again, the local authorities. We have to report uh, to the local police station twice a day, both of us, with our temperatures and any physical signs of illness. So uh, that would include not just a fever, but coughing, um, body aches, uh, you know, uh, restriction in the chest, any of those things that might indicate that we are infected with the coronavirus. Uh, in addition to that, I had to sign a document. Uh, and send it to the police station saying that I would comply with all of these uh, rules. Now, I'm not exactly sure what it would mean if I went against any of these things. If I broke any of these rules, it might mean probably expulsion from the country. Um, I don't think it would mean imprisonment for a foreign citizen, but it could mean uh, those kind of uh, punishments for a for a local. So they're taking this very, very seriously. And again, that's kind of in line with the last video you saw, just how strict they are with people coming and going, which I think is all fantastic, and it should be done everywhere. So I want to stress here that I am in full compliance with all of these measures. I don't agree with everything that's being done here as far as forcing uh, certain people to get checkups and forcing them to go to the hospital. Some of those things are, are, I think, maybe causing more damage than good. But overall, the response to this, I think, is definitely help to get, helping to get those numbers down. So what that leads us to is, again, what we said in the last video and what I've been saying all along, China clearly knows how dangerous this is. They've never done anything like this before. Schools are still closed indefinitely. They are taking this extremely seriously, as is uh, many countries, or as are many countries that are now getting hit hard by this. Now, today what we want to talk about is numbers. Now, it's easy to misinterpret numbers. It's easy to look at numbers and think that those numbers are representative of an entire situation. But one thing we have to remember when we look at numbers is that those numbers are only a reflection of what we know. They are not a reflection of an actual situation. So we're going to look at a couple of countries today and, and kind of see how that can be the case. So first we're going to look at um, Korea. Now if you guys have been following the news, and I hope you have, uh, Korea is um, really going through a, a tough time right now. Uh, there's a lot of uh, fear in the country right now. Uh, there are a lot of school closures, uh, public gatherings have been canceled, uh, religious services have been canceled, um, and there are massive uh, numbers of people coming out uh, with uh, symptoms every day. Uh, and in fact, uh, yesterday it went up again. The current uh, count there of confirmed cases in South Korea is 3,736. So that's really risen quite quickly in the last week. Um, now, it's easy to look at those numbers in South Korea and say, wow, South Korea is a really risky place to be. It's really, really dangerous. It's easy to kind of interpret the numbers that way. But what we really have to look at is how much testing they're doing in Korea. Now when it comes to testing, it seems that South Korea is doing better and doing smarter things uh, than any other country. Uh, now according to the Worldometers site here, South Korea is currently able to test 10,000 people a day. And they're working to increase that to 15 to 20,000 people a day. Now, not only that, but Korea is doing something really ingenious that we haven't seen in other countries yet, and that is that they're doing mobile testing facilities or drive-through testing facilities. So you can see a picture of that here, and what this means is that they're able to test people without getting into contact with possibly infected individuals. This is a really, really forward-thinking idea. We already know that 
this disease is very transmissible. We've seen that from the cruise ship. Uh, we're seeing that uh, from what's happened there in Wuhan and even what's happening there in Korea in that church, how quickly they're saying that possibly 9,000 people are showing symptoms just from that one uh, cluster, that one community in the church. So it spreads very, very quickly. And this is a great way to contain that. Instead of having people waiting in busy hospitals that are coughing and sneezing on other people and on surfaces, possibly spreading that infection, they're telling people, no, stay in your car, drive through, give us a swab, we'll do a test, and then we'll send you the results. So go home. That is a way, a great way to contain this thing. So because China, is, or because Korea is doing more testing, obviously they're going to have more positive results. So how many tests have they actually done? This is an important thing to keep in mind. As of the current uh, Worldometer's report, and I think this number is probably low because it hasn't gone up in the last few days. Remember, these countries are not required to report how many they've tested every, every day. Um, but when those new numbers come out, they go onto the Worldometer site. According to the numbers here in the Worldometer site, um, it is 66,652 tests. Now, again, I think that number is low. It might even be closer to 100,000 by now since they're testing so many people per day. But that's still a huge number, 66,652. Now, South Korea has a population of 51.47 million people. So that means that as of this number, they have tested 1 in 772 people of the entire country. That is tremendous. I believe that ratio may be even higher than China, which many cities have not done testing unless people are already sick. So they are being very proactive in testing people. Now. When we look at these numbers, when we look at Korea, is it really a high-risk area? Well, it's true that a lot of people are confirmed. However, there are very few people there that are showing serious symptoms or are in serious condition, meaning likely that they're hooked up to a ventilator because they can't breathe uh, with their own lungs. Now, if we look at, again, the Worldometer site currently there in South Korea, there are only 10 people that are listed as critical. So that's incredible. 3,700 confirmed cases only 10 are in critical condition. And those numbers would seem to correlate correctly because we see the total deaths in the country is still relatively low. Of course, there are no more deaths being reported every day, but again, in a number of 3,700, nearly 4,000, those numbers, those figures, the percentage is still relatively low. So South Korea, can we say high risk or low risk? It seems like now many countries now are getting many cases, so they may all have large numbers, but Korea is definitely doing a lot to contain the infection. So it looks like testing wise, they're trying to catch it early, make sure that people don't get to that critical stage, treat them early. If they do get to the critical stage, make sure they're quarantined and getting the proper care. So it seems like Korea is doing a fantastic job with this. Now, what about in the US? Now, from the beginning of this, I was concerned about how the US would uh, react to this because Korea and China and the US are very different in terms of what the government is able to do to control people moving around. Uh, Korea, like China, has neighborhoods that usually have one or two entrances. Um, this is very similar to way, the way uh, the neighborhoods are designed here in China. So they're large complexes with a couple of gates. Most people live in these kinds of uh, settings. So it's very easy for the authorities to clamp down on travel. It's very easy for them to monitor people coming out with symptoms and, and to employ these kinds of measures. In the U.S., it's not. People are spread out. They often live in neighborhoods that don't have a gate but are simply on a street. So it's much more difficult to control the flow of people. It's much more difficult to try to quarantine uh, people. Now, in U the U.S., let's look at the numbers. <clears throat> now, these numbers have gone up uh, quite a bit in the last week or so. However, currently, the U.S. is only reporting 76 confirmed cases. That went up by 8 since the last report, but currently 76 confirmed cases cases. Now, can we look at this number and say, well, since the number is low, that means the U.S. is safe. It's a lower risk than Korea. I beg to differ. Um, and that is, again, by looking at the tests being done. Remember, Korea had 66,000 tests, possibly 100,000 tests by now. Now, what about the U.S.? Well, as of this Worldometer site, the U.S. has only done 445 tests. Now, likely that number is a little bit higher. It might be 470. I saw one report say 472. But either way, it has not even come close to Korea's testing. Now, the population in the U.S. is 327 million. So if they've done 472 tests, that means they have tested one in 693 
thousand people. So in Korea, they've tested one in 772 people. They have a large number because they're catching people early. In the U.S., they've only tested one in 693,000 people of the population. So we really can't look at these confirmed cases and judge how much of a threat there really is to, to the public health. And in fact, there are many stories coming out more and more of people who believe that they have this coronavirus. The doctors also think, they also suspect people have coronavirus, but they're not testing. Here's one story of a case. Uh, this guy, uh, he goes by the name of John here. This is not his real name. They're protecting his identity here. But uh, he lives in Brooklyn. He spent a week in Japan. He went to a hospital on February 27th. He had a fever. He had a cough. He had body aches. They did a bunch of tests. They tested for 25 viruses. All came back negative. And so at this point, the doctors called the CDC requesting permission to do a, a COVID-19 test. What did the CDC say? Well, they said the man did not have life-threatening symptoms, and so he was discharged. Not only was he discharged, but he said he was told that since he didn't have the virus, he could go to work. He could take the subway home. He could go back to life as normal. Well, he didn't do this. Fortunately, he's self-quarantined. He's still in self-quarantine, uh, monitoring his symptoms. Now, he is getting better. He's younger. We know that the, the virus is not as lethal for, for younger people, so it's likely that he will um, recover and, and have no problems. However, this just shows that people that look like they could be high risk are not getting tested. And in fact, something that was even more worrisome about this particular uh, article and, and again, this is, a, this is a Reddit, so we can't say this is 100% accurate. However, um, this story was covered on by several news organizations that went back and verified this man's hospital record. So we can say with a fair amount of you know, certainty that this is a legitimate case. This isn't just someone posting trolling on the internet. Um, now, just to follow up on that news uh, story, what, what happened to this man is later, the CDC expanded their criteria. They said, okay, if you've traveled from Japan now, since that's a higher risk area, now we'll do the test on you. Well, at this point, the hospital that this man, John, was staying at, called again the CDC and said, okay, well, we want a test for this guy now. What did they say? Well, they said that because he is not currently hospitalized, they can't give him the test. So this is what we're seeing, and this is not an isolated case. For weeks now, I've been reading cases from doctors, from nurses, from, from these healthcare workers and clinics that are very concerned because they're seeing people come in with these symptoms, and they may have had contact with people who have traveled to Asia, or they're able to somehow create a link between them and, and others that may have come into contact. But because the CDC is so stringent with their testing criteria, they're not willing to perform the tests. Now, there is more and more news that is going in line with this. For example, in Hawaii, this is where I'm from, or Hawaii as we say it there, but in Hawaii, doctors there flagged eight people for coronavirus symptoms, but none of them have been tested again because the CDC refused to do the tests. Uh, experts here, according to this article, say the U.S. isn't remotely prepared for testing. Now, it's important to remember that the first case in the U.S. for coronavirus, the first confirmed case, was not a week ago. It wasn't two weeks ago. It wasn't even a month ago. It was on January 21st. So that's going on six weeks now that this disease has been present here in the U.S. We've had reports of possible community spread multiple times in different parts of the U.S. And in fact, as I was putting the notes for this video together just a few minutes ago, this news article came up. From the New York Times, coronavirus may have spread in U.S. for weeks, according to gene sequencing. So they're looking at the genes from two separate cases that were weeks apart, and they believe there's a link there. So this thing is out there. It is spreading in the U.S. So what does this all amount to? Well, what, what really worries me, looking at how things are developing there in the U.S., is that it seems so similar to what happened in the early stages there in Wuhan. Doctors that were wanting to report it, but authorities not wanting to report it, people that were showing these very troubling symptoms similar to SARS, but were not getting tested, not reporting, not letting the, the general public know, in fact, telling the public there was no problem, there was no issue, not taking action. Now, Wuhan, for at least three weeks, did not take action, and we know what the results were. Needless illness, overwhelmed hospitals, sick staff, panic, extreme containment measures, and ultimately, unnecessary deaths. These are numbers that likely we'll never actually know. We know the official numbers, but <laughs> evidence suggests the numbers are much, much higher, and we'll never know how bad it was. 
So it's just so fearful uh, for me looking at this and seeing how similar what happened in Wuhan is to currently what's happening there in the U.S. Do they know something we don't? Are the U.S. citizens somehow immune to this? Or are they just hoping that the warm weather will burn it off? I don't know. But uh, looking from this viewpoint and knowing what happened here in, in China, uh, it's incredibly worrisome. So what does this all equate to? What does this mean for you as a viewer watching this possibly in the U.S.? And really, no matter where you are now, it's likely that in your country there are cases that either have been reported or haven't been reported. And it's very likely that the numbers that are reported are not reflective of the actual number of sick people in the country. What can you do? Well, the same things that we've said in all these videos. Number one, being hygienic, washing your hands regularly, washing your hands almost fanatically, getting in the habit of washing your hands as often as you can and not touching your face, using soap and warm water, using uh, antiseptic wipes, using alcohol-based sanitizers to disinfect your hands. If you're going to cough, don't cough into your hands, don't cough onto the table or into you know, surfaces that people are going to touch. Cough into your sleeve and when you get home, wash your clothes uh, thoroughly. You know what we've done here if you've been watching these videos. Every time we grow grocery shopping, when we come home, we disinfect everything. We are taking no chances with this disease. Other things that you can do that many countries are now mandating or are recommending, for example, Italy, South Korea, Japan, is to practice social distancing, putting distance between yourself and others. That would mean avoiding large events like uh, ball games, uh, sporting events, concerts, uh, any area where people are in very, very close contact, very, very close confines, those are going to be high-risk areas. Also, if you're sick, if you have a fever, stay home. Uh, get a checkup. Get medical advice. Do not infect other people. Stay away from people who have these symptoms. Another thing you can do, just a small thing that uh, is not incredibly difficult, change your routine a little bit. Um, when you go grocery shopping, go at hours that are not extremely busy. Perhaps late at night, right before closing, is a good time to go. You might not get the freshest things, but you'll be there at a time when it's not extremely busy. These kind of areas are, are really hotbeds for diseases and viruses to spread. So think about ways that you can adjust your life to have less contact with others. And again, start thinking about what it will mean if you have to go into quarantine. Because looking at other countries, it's likely this is going to be a similar practice that is employed there in the U.S. So think about how schooling is going to work. Contact that school. Think about how your own work might be affected. Can you work from home? Are you set up to do teleconferencing? Are you able to continue your work without seeing people face to face? I don't know why the CDC isn't taking this more seriously. Um, they have recently announced, a couple days ago I believe, that they have a new test kit that is more accurate but it's going to take a while for that to, to be put into production and get out to the facilities. They say with, um, within a week, they'll be able to start using it. But within a week, that's, that's a lot more time that a lot more people could be infected. So again, it's likely at this point that there are people everywhere across the U.S. and in fact across the world that already are carrying this disease. Now, again, most people will be fine. Most people will not show uh, very serious symptoms, but some will. A good percentage of the population will come down with some serious uh, form of pneumonia and uh, that will cause problems in any healthcare scenario, in any healthcare system. So take these measures, be careful. We have to watch this day to day, but start taking precautions now. Hopefully this was helpful. We'll see you guys next time and hopefully I'll have better news for you then.